China cannot sell the products it produces in China because over a billion people in China live in absolute poverty and can't buy it. They're the hostage to European and American consumers. And their great fear is that, that cons those consumers, if they go into recession, won't buy these products. Uh, the problem the Chinese have is they can't invest their own money into the Chinese economy. There's no room to put it. There are enough workers, there are enough land, and so on. So they have this massive hangover, which they're willing to invest anywhere else in the world to get out of China. So there is a very good relationship between the United States and China. The Chinese get to sell products to the Americans. The Americans get these products. The problem the Chinese have is that their wage rates are now higher than those of other countries. It is cheaper to hire workers in Mexico today than in China. Their great historic advantage is dissolving, yet they must continue to export. The American desire that the Chinese ch change the value of the yuan, they have float it, of course will never happen. The Chinese can't afford to let that happen because that would make their exports even more expensive and place them in even more difficult trouble. So the United States enjoys jerking their chain by saying you should float the yuan and Chinese respond by saying we will do that in a few years as soon as something else happens that's unnamed. And the Chinese condemn the United States for their naval activities and all of these are words. These two countries are locked together in a very beneficial relationship in the long run, it's more beneficial to the Americans than to the Chinese, and that's one of the paradoxes. But again, it takes a long time for people to realize that economies have failed or recovered. I remember back in the 93, people were still speaking about the Japanese superstate uh, long after uh, the banking system collapsed. Uh, one of the interesting things about the global financial community is they always seem to be about two years behind reality. And the China situation is that they are in the midst of a massive slowdown. They're admitting to a certain degree of slowdown. We suspect it's much more substantial than that. In fact, given, a Jap given Chinese um, inflation rate, they may be entering negative territory. Uh, so this is a country that has had a magnificent run up in 30 years. It is going to be an important economic and military and political power over the next century, but for right now it's got problems. The question of Chinese growth is a wrong question. I can grow anything if I cut profit margins to the bone or take losses. According to the Chinese Ministry of Finance, Chinese profits on their exports are about 1.7 percent, which means that some of these people are exporting at almost no level. The Chinese grow their economy, not in the way that Western economies grow, that when you sell more product, you make more money. Uh, the Chinese grow their economy to avoid unemployment. The Chinese nightmare is unemployment because in China, unemployment leads to massive social unrest. Therefore, the Chinese government is prepared to subsidize factories that really should be bankrupt because they're so inefficient in order to keep these companies going. Uh, they will lend money to these companies, not to grow them, but in order to make certain that they don't default on other loans. So I think one of the mistakes we make is the growth rate of China being the measure of Chinese health. I want everybody to remember that in the 1980s, Japan was growing phenomenally, and yet their banking system crashed in spite of the fact of having vast dollar reserves. So when you look at the Japanese example, you see a situation where growth rates, which Western is focused on, were assumed to be a sign of health, when in fact they were uh, simply a solution to a problem, unemployment, and underneath it the economy was quite unhealthy. This doesn't mean that China doesn't have a large economy, but having a large economy and being able to sustain healthy, balanced growth are two very different things. Wouldn't it be in the interests of both countries to find more common ground, perhaps to work together to make the Western Pacific a zone of peace involving Japan and other countries? Well, first of all, there is a zone of peace in that region. There's no war going on. 
Secondly, the guarantor of this zone of peace is the American Seventh Fleet. The Chinese can't do anything about it. As for tension bubbling about, so much of this is what I'll call newspaper babble. Uh, some minister or some secretary says something hostile, uh, something is said. These are merely words. Here's the underlying fact. The United States doesn't treat China as an equal or an unequal. It treats it as China. Uh, and as a country, it has interests, and those interests may coincide with the American or not. But the United States uh, and any other country treats any other country as it is in its interests. In many cases, the problem really is that observers of China have bought into the Chinese view that China is a superpower economically, militarily, politically, and therefore the United States should treat it as such. But the fact is that China is far from a superpower in any of these realms. It remains a relatively weak economic power, certainly a weak military and political power, and the United States treats it as it is, a significant regional power with a great many weaknesses. Uh, and when it threatens, threatens American interests, the United States is quite happy to slap it back. But the possibility of confrontation between the world's first and second largest economy troubles many countries in the Asia-Pacific region, most of all Japan and Korea, but also many nations of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and a resources giant, Australia. Well, I mean, it's interesting that they're troubled. I must admit I've never understood what it means for a nation to be troubled. I understand people being troubled. Uh, Look, there can't be a confrontation militarily between the United States and China. Uh, firstly, because the United States is incapable of intruding on mainland China militarily. Uh, it's a vast population, a large army. And China has no naval capability worthy of the name. They have launched their first aircraft carrier. That means they have one aircraft carrier. They don't have the cruisers. They don't necessarily have the advanced attack submarines. They don't have the Aegis defense systems. In other words, they've launched a ship, and now they have to train their pilots to land and take off from the ship. And the aircraft that take off from the ship have to be able to engage and survive American F-14s. Uh, the distance between being a challenge to the United States and having one aircraft carrier uh, is vast and generational. Because not only do they have to train the people to fly off the deck, they have to train naval commanders, admirals, to command carrier battle groups, and even more admirals who know how to command groups of carrier battle groups. The United States has been in the business of handling carrier battle groups since the 1930s. Uh, the Chinese have not yet floated their first carrier battle group, and one isn't enough. And so it's really important to understand that while China has made a minor movement in floating aircraft carrier, a technology that is now 80 years old, just about, uh, that's very nice, but that does not make them a power. Over a billion people live in households earning less than $3 a day. China is actually an extraordinarily poor country. And so you have the situation that the great promise of China has dissolved. There are a lot of people unhappy about this, and the Chinese government is trying to deal with this politically by clamping down and preventing any unrest. China is now a dictatorship. Uh, it has always been a dictatorship, now it really is showing its muscle. And the real question is no longer economic. It is, can the Chinese government hold China together? China's investment in Africa is not really investment. It's capital flight. It is give me any asset class that I can invest in that's not in China. This is like Japan when it bought Rockefeller Center, when Japanese bought Pebble Beach. Uh, everybody said, my goodness, the Japanese are just enormous. Well, the fact is the Japanese wouldn't be investing in the United States if they had any confidence in Japan. The Chinese would not be putting their money into Zimbabwe if they thought well of the Chinese economy. This is an attempt to get the money out of the country. And it's really not uh, Zimbabwe and Africa they're investing in. It's the American markets. This huge inflow of not only Chinese money, but European money into the markets. And when we start looking at what is holding these markets up, it is all the bad news in China and Europe and the money.